Good morning, everyone. Welcome to join us for our today's worship. Let us prepare our hearts to worship our mighty God. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16, 8 to 10, and verse 23 to 25, it says, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared among all gods. Let us all come together and pray. Lord, we want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to worship you. You have gathered us from all different places. Father, with all our hearts, we give praise to you. And with, with all that I am, I praise your holy name. We also want to proclaim your name. Make known among the nations what you have done. We want to proclaim your salvation. We will never forget how kind you have been. You save us and give us eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, now we humbly come before you. We ask for your forgiveness. Please forgive our sins and our wrongdoings. Don't let sins hinder us to come to you. Your kindness and love are a crown on our heads. Each day that we live, we provide, you provide our needs and give us the strength that we need. Lord, we just can't stop. We want to continue to lift your name on high. We gladly surrender our lives to you in worship and in praise. Now we are here to worship you and praise your name. May you accept our worship and our praises. We pray all this in your mighty name, Jesus Christ. Amen. How is everyone doing? Do you get used to your life now? Or you are tired mentally or physically? Do you feel lonely? Being locked down at home, at nowhere to go, it may make a person feel depressed. Today, I want to encourage you to deeply engage to the worship, not only to us, but to our mighty God. He is our living hope. As a Christian, we may choose a different way to live. We should change our focus. Let us lift our spirit, put our eyes onto God, not to this world, not to the numbers of cases of the pandemic that we see every day on the newspaper. Now you might be sitting on a couch, on an office chair, or perhaps on your bed. I encourage you to join us. Close your eyes. Imagine that you are in a valley. You can see green pasture, a stream flowing, and a group of deer by the stream side drinking water. Well, where are you now? 
you are sitting on the lap of God. He is hugging you. You are not alone. You have brothers and sisters, just like us here. You have us. We are by your side. And just like the deer have their other deer by the side, by the stream. As the deer pander for the water, we long after God. God wants us to drink the living water He has given to us. God alone is our heart's desires, and we long to worship Him. God is our strength, our shield, and our protection. He never forsakes us. As we sing along this song, as the deer, I want you to feel the presence of God, and you have us as a brother and sister by your side anytime as well. Let us all sing as the deer.
are great to us. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. You just can't stop to say that. Great are you, Lord.
in our lives. So we pour our praise, we pour our praise, it's your breath in our lives. So we pour our praise to you only. You may all be seated. Our today's scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 to 22. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be faction amongst you in order that those who are joining among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's supper you are eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate? those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I command you in these? No, I will not. Today we have Pastor John Tong sharing his message from his home. And his title is How to Prevent Divisions in Our Church. Hi everyone. I've been away on a sabbatical for the last two months. It was a very good time for my wife and me. During our sabbatical, I did a lot of reading on racism, since this is a big issue that is facing our country. We spent time working on small repair projects around our home. We also spent two weeks with our daughter's family and our grandkids outside Boston. My wife and I also spent a week at a minister's cottage in Central Virginia for personal retreat. So it was a very restful and fruitful sabbatical. As I was reading on racism, I also got drawn into readings about classism, which is grouping people based on socioeconomic status. It was in reading about classism that I came across an interesting explanation of the impact of class on the ways the early church practiced the Lord's Supper. And I thought it would be helpful for us to understand this background since we participate in the Lord's Supper regularly. The passage we will look at today is from 1 Corinthians 7, 17 to 22. And there we read, In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. This passage comes before the well-known passage that gives the words Jesus used when he served his own disciples, the Lord's Supper or Last Supper. You have heard these words of Jesus when you were served the Lord's Supper. But you may or may not have connected the passage we just read to how it reveals certain practices of the early church when they had Lord's Supper. For that, we ought to thank historical and archaeological research in the 1970s that has given us more insight into the life of the early church. Virtually every commentator since the early 1980s refers to the dining customs and arrangements of the Roman world that we have learned as having an impact on the reason for divisions when believers met to share the Lord's Supper. In fact, it is possible to visit the site excavated by the American team led in the late 1970s by James Wiseman of the villa dated between 50 and 75 AD in Corinth, which is around the time that Paul wrote this letter. The actual remains of this house only exist to a little above floor level. However, it is enough to show what the house would have been like. 
Here is a 3D view reconstructed by an archaeologist from the remains of an elite house at Anup Loga near Corinth. And here is the same house with the label enlarged in the corner for you to read it. This house has an atrium indicated by the arrow. The first room upon entering the house. The atrium was a public area where the householder's clients, if he was doing business, and visitors waited to be received. The pool in the center would collect rainwater and store it in a space below. About 30 people can fit into the atrium. Then inside the house, there is a room called the triclinium, which is indicated by another arrow. The triclinium is a dining room in the private part of the house for which a guest would need an invitation. The room would normally fit 9 to 15 people who reclined on large couches around low tables in the center. It's called triclinium because there would be three large couches on three sides of the table, of the low tables. Now let's ask, what kinds of people might be invited to dine here? What might happen if the space reached its capacity? Well, special friends of the householder or wealthy, connected people will be invited to the triclinium. The Roman world, as it is true for many other countries, was very class conscious. The quality of food, drink, service, and comfort would be of a higher order in the triclinium, especially if some in the atrium could arrive only after the best of the meal was over. Maybe they have to work late. Or maybe they didn't have food to eat. As a side note, it has been shown that there was a famine in Corinth around this time of the early church. If so, that would especially affect those who had less to start with. So when they came to the house, they had not eaten and were hoping to get some food. In fact, famine has been a regular problem in the world throughout history. We are fortunate if we've never experienced this problem. Now let's get back to the triclinium. One historical account from a guest who attended a triclinium in someone's home wrote these words, the best dishes were set in front of the host and a select few, and cheap scraps of food before the rest of the company. The host had even put the wine into a very small flask, divided into three categories, one for himself and us, another for his lesser friends, all his friends are graded and the third for his and our free persons, meaning non-slaves. As you can see, there was inequality or favoritism, and this should not be. We can say in the broadest way possible that these people didn't practice table manners. They were thinking about themselves first without thinking about other people. But the implication was even more devastating for a church that practiced this. During that time, churches did not have church buildings to worship in, so they mostly worshipped in homes. And more often than not, someone who was better off and had a larger house would host the people of the church. Often a quote-unquote love feast or fellowship meal would accompany communion, meaning communion was more of an event than it is in many churches today. But what was happening here in this Corinthian church was that they were more influenced by the culture around them than the life that Christ wants the church community to live out. So when the church came together for a fellowship meal as well as to celebrate the Lord's Supper, the homeowner still gave the best places of the house to those he favored. And he put those believers who were less well-off economically in the atrium. This was the sin of favoritism, which the Bible often warns about. One example of this warning is in James chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. My brothers, as believers in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? This sounds like the situation in Corinth. 
This way of behaving was bringing the culture of the world into the life of the church. This was perpetuating a first class versus a second class group of people mentality. Yet they were one church, united based on Christ's death for sinners, whether rich or poor, slave or free. Yet they had not yet worked out the implication of how Christ wants his church to be and to live. You ever go on a plane and see some people sitting in first class seats while you're squeezed in between other people in the back half of the plane? That always happens to me. I've never sat in a first class seat. The church is not supposed to treat people like passengers on a plane. The wealthy or famous people sitting in the best seats, given great food and drink, while most of the people are sitting in the back, given ordinary food and drink. In the church, there are no premier memberships that entitle you to have more privileges, no platinum memberships, no gold membership. There is just membership in Christ. And the reason the church is not supposed to have different classes of memberships is because our status in the church is not dependent on our income, our wealth, or ability. It simply depends on Christ. In Christ, when he died for us, he died for rich people's sins and poor people's sins. He died for Nicodemus as well as for the beggar. He died for Paul the scholar as well as the uneducated fisherman. You can all come to Christ because the only thing that matters is whether you have faith in him to save you from your sins and to be your Lord. In Christ, we are all one team. We are equal members in him. We are all members of his spiritual body, each part honoring and respecting the other parts. But with our human nature still in us, we have to depend on Christ, continue to live this out. Now, when I say that the church in Corinth had this problem of unequal treatment, I don't mean to say that everyone in that church had this attitude. Paul says about this wrong practice that to some extent, I believe it. There were some who practiced this unfair treatment, though he's not saying everyone practiced it, practiced it or agreed with it. But not only did this unfair treatment cause division based on economic status, but very practically, it also caused the group in the triclinium to be full of food and drunken with wine, while the group in the atrium was still hungry and had poor wine to drink. This is why Paul said, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. These are very strong words. What Paul is really saying is asking, who is in fact the real host of the Lord's Supper? Is it the owner of the house or is it Christ, the head of the church? Whose supper is it really? And the answer is, of course, Christ is the real host of this supper. Then to back up his point, Paul reminds the church of the words Jesus used at the Lord's Supper when he ate with his disciples. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 25. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul repeats these words of Jesus to remind the church who is really the host of the supper? Paul is saying this is the Lord's Supper, not your supper. He's saying the church is the Lord's church, not yours. This is his money. This is his life in me and in you. All that we have belongs to him and has meaning because of him. Now let's ask a different question. How do you think Jesus will act? When he ate with people. Actually, the Bible gives us quite a few examples of how Jesus acted when he ate with others. There is Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners. 
There is Jesus at a wedding banquet in Cana of Galilee. There is Jesus feeding the 5,000 with fish and bread. There is Jesus eating when Judas, his betrayer, was with him. And then there is this one, which I will dwell, dwell on a bit more. In Luke 14, verses 12 to 14, we read, Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus is not saying you can never invite your friends or family to your home for a meal. Hospitality and friendship are still important, and family or friends are important to us. But what Jesus is saying here is if all you do is invite family and friends to your party, and then they invite you back, then you're always getting together only with the people who are already close to you. But how about others that you're not that close to yet? You're not thinking about them. You're not caring for them as Jesus cared for those who could not pay him back. So will you also invite other people you know to your home for a meal or a cup of coffee in a socially distanced way now who may not be able to invite you back to their home for whatever reason? I should also add that nowadays we partake of the Lord's Supper in churches and not in homes, although in the pandemic you are partaking at home. But because the elements are so small and there's only the bread and the cup and not a full meal, there is not the problem of eating too much or drinking too much that they had in the early church. So in that sense, we don't have the temptation during the Lord's Supper to give more food or drink to some people than to others. But what our and each church can do is to ask ourselves, are we treating different people in our church fairly? Are there any ways that we are not? And if so, how can we make things right? I know one example our church has tried to treat people fairly is having three different language worship services. At one time, we only had two services, English and then also Mandarin translated into Cantonese, often by earphones for Cantonese listeners. But church leaders realized that this is not a good pattern to go in the long run, that we needed to give the Cantonese language group their own worship services in their own language. So we added a Cantonese worship service. And when we tried to reach out to Cantonese grassroots workers in restaurants with the gospel and invite them to our church, we found that they didn't want to come because they perceived our church people as being more well-off than they were, and they didn't think they would be comfortable or fit in. So what did we do? We tried several things. We had a worship service on Monday nights because that was their day off. We also tried to go to restaurants and have Bible-based meetings with the workers there. These are examples in which we try to be fair to another language group and try to find ways to take their needs into account. So this is a live question for our church too. How to treat people fairly and how to make them who are different feel welcome than the majority of the church? These are not abstract questions. They are real questions. We can apply these questions to our effort to reach out to different cultures and racial backgrounds, such as our Rock City Fellowship. So as we conclude, let me share with you several things we should all do by way of application. The first thing is treat everyone equally. Don't show favoritism. Respect everyone with dignity. Give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Don't judge people unless you have a valid reason to judge a certain way based on evidence. I believe if we treated people equally, it will solve a lot of problems. And when we don't treat people equally, there will rise up a lot of problems. The second thing, be concerned about those who have less. This is not a contradiction to the first application. We should treat everyone equally. But those who have more are in a better position to take care of themselves, while those who have needs that we can help to meet, we should do that. So get to know people so you know what their needs are. 
and give your time and resources to help them who needs your help without taking over their life. And then the third application is to remember Christ gave his life for you. Always keep in mind that Christ gave his life for you. So we should also be generous in our giving to others. There is no reason to boast if we have riches because it ultimately is Christ who provided it for us. And he wants us to be good steward of what he has given to us. And if you have less, don't lose your trust in God and don't despise yourself. God sees your need and he will provide a way out so you can stand up under it, which is what Paul promised God would do in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. Christ giving himself to you in his death and resurrection is proof that he cares for you. Take hope in that now and forever. Let's pray. Our dear Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that Jesus came to correct what was wrong. Not only to save sinners, which we desperately need to be saved from, but also to give his example how you want us to live. So help us to imitate our Lord and Savior. He is our master. We are his servants. Let us follow his ways. And let us therefore treat people equally. Let us reach out to be especially concerned with those who have less, even as Jesus did so. And let us always remember we live by grace, the grace that Christ has given to us, and not by our own effort or our own ability and performance. Thank you for your good grace to encourage us and to also give us pattern that we can live out as a church and as your people in this world. Help us do this, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Chong, for sharing the message, how to prevent divisions. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 to 6, it says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We need to love each other. There is no favoritism or no small group um, among us. Let us sing together, we are the body of Christ.
one body. We are one heart and one spirit and one voice just to glorify our Lord. Now it's our announcement time. First announcement. Once again, we thank you, Pastor John Tong, share his message to us. And today, we have Sunday school at 11.45, and we're starting a new book, it's First Peter. So join us at 11.45 through Zoom. And this is a new thing. We will meet virtually on August 30th at 8 p.m. So invite your friends, your family to join us. Whether it, they are from our church or not from our church, we welcome everyone to join us. And we are going to meet through Google Meet. There is the, the link over there. Or if you need further information, you can contact pa um, Brother John here. <laughs> Next one. Okay. We should never stop praying because prayer gives us the strength. And we especially need it in this needy time. So the prayer items was, uh, is listed there. So first one, we pray for our Panama, uh, Panama missionary Lily's pregnancy. So she is in her late pregnancy term. Uh, huh? she, oh, the, the latest news. She just gave birth to a baby. Okay. So it's a healthy baby. We praise the Lord for that. And second, we want to pray for the upcoming new school year. And the third one, um, we want to challenge the Christians to take up the gospel challenge in this um, pandemic time, in this needy time, or in these specials, um, not, not normal, where people are staying home or feeling depressed time. So let us pray with one heart, one spirit, and one voice. Dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you because you entrust an asset to Lily and Michael. From the conception throughout the pregnancy, you have shown mercy and grace to them. And we are ha very happy to know that they, Lily just gave birth to a healthy baby. From yesterday's sharing, we know that she has some complication. But Lord, you are faithful. You just give them a healthy baby. We can't stop to say that hallelujah. We want to praise you, Lord. Father, please continue to help Lily and Michael. As a new baby comes to their family, they, knew, they need a lot of adjustments. They need to know how to arrange their family matters and also their church uh, serve, serving matters. Lord, please let Lily recover fast. Let us have a healthy body that she can take care of the baby and also take care of church matters. Second, we want to pray for all the students, especially those who are from our church. We, meet, we miss seeing them, from the young ones to the college students. We miss their voice, we miss their love. We will be seeing them running around very soon in August, end of August or in September. They are going back to school but they're going back virtually. It is a new thing for young little kids, especially to those who transition to a new school from a fifth grader to a sixth grader or from people that are entering the college. They are not able to see their new school, to feel the new school, to meet their new friends. So Lord, please help them. Let them settle down in the new setting of a study. And at the same time, they may continue to know about you, to seek you, because they are not able to come back to church to attend Sunday school. But through, our, through their parents or through our other activities, they are able to continue to learn about you. And lastly, Father, love is very important. We know that a lot of people are eagerly waiting to be loved. We as a Christians, we want to share the love that we have from the Lord. So I encourage you to take up this gospel challenge. Let us prepare ourselves and our mind, our hearts, to put into action to share the love of God, the love of Christ. Let everyone 
you know, this world is full of love. You can get it when you open your heart. They are able to accept the Christ love. They are able to get the eternal life that Lord has been prepared for them. So Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit can help us and equip us and encourage us when we are feeling weak. Father, we just want to thank you because you have been faithful to us. We want to continue to give ourselves, we dedicate ourselves so that we can humble before you and work together with you and not walk in front of you. We want to walk together with you so that we can glorify you. You can use us in through your ministry. Thank you, Lord. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We have benedictions from Pastor John. And now let me close with this benediction and blessing from the Lord. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And now it's doxology. Please rise. Be seated and you have your reflection prayer.